This is the December edition of Operation City on Your Hill. I'm your host, Robert Maynard. The title of tonight's show is going to be Democracy in America, and it's uh, basically it's the title of a book by a famous book, his most famous book, Alexis de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville was a French historian who had written a lot about the, the issue of democracy, and he came to America as a solution to a problem he saw with European democracy. Um, now, th this, this show is a follow-up of last week's show, or last month's show, I'm sorry. Last month, we d did a show called The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium. Now, <clears throat> my argument was the revolt of the republic, of the public, is in response to a failure of democracy. We have, oh, not really the rule of the people, but we have a rule of, of government bureaucracy because government is taking too much over, taking control of too much of our lives. And so we have everything, every problem we have is being addressed by government programs, government solutions, and you have to create a bureaucracy in order to administer those programs and more and more people's lives are being taken over by rules and regulations that come from these programs. Alexis de Tocqueville warned about this a long time ago. He came here in the 1830s. He wrote this book called Democracy in America, and he was writing about a phenomena that he referred to as soft despotism, which he saw as the future, main future threat to freedom, more so than obvious tyranny, or what he referred to as hard despotism. And he was saying that you're having... The hard despot, now we've seen hard despotism, it popped up again in the 20th century, and you've seen fascism, and you've seen communism, and you've seen Nazism, and you've seen these authoritarian regimes, and you see now you see these Islamists, which the moderate Islam Muslims reject as pol political, as, and refer to as political Islam. But basically it's an attempt to politicize every aspect of human behavior. And this is true of communism, socialism, Islamism, Nazism, and more and more is becoming true of what we call liberal democracy. And de Tocqueville saw this problem in America and he saw this is gonna be the real threat to freedom in the future because we, democracy has, in his view, has conquered totalitarian, hard despotism. So. Everybody wants to be democratic, or supposedly, this was his view. <clears throat> but there was a threat to f our freedom within democracy itself. And he came to America because he saw in Amer the American experiment the solution to the problem he saw with European democracy. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about the a little bit more about the impetus. There's a couple of different reasons why I'm following up on this and spending more time on it. One is, as I mentioned before, we have this impeachment hearings going on, which, yeah, you got the Republicans and, and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, and it's a political, people say, well, this is partisan political battle. Well, yeah, it's, but at heart, I think we have a battle going on over whether or not democracy is going to survive, and whether or not we're going to take the rule of law seriously. Now, unfortunately, because of the obvious threat that the um, actions of our current president has taken, is an, is an obvious threat. People, so you got, you got the people who are running the impeachment inquiry. They went through them. Today you had this, they announced articles of impeachment. And because of the obvious threat that is this pose, I think we're losing sight of the more subtle threat. And I, I'm, basically, I, I agree this is a threat and it's a problem. And I, I, it's, it's, it's a shame that it's more people are not taking it more seriously, because it is a serious problem. But it's masking a problem that's been here a lot longer and it's a lot deeper because, and maybe more problematic because it's more subtle. And the reason why I think is we're not going to get this debate is because the, the people who would be in a position to be pushing back on this are pushing back in the wrong way. And that would be the, the ones who are supporting Trump against what is supposedly a deep state, deep state conspiracy. 
Now, because of this, um, a critique of the current liberal dem democratic order is going to, in many times, is being brushed off as these people pushing this deep state conspiracy theory. But which is, you know, Trump's being is is a victim of this conspiracy by these ingrained bureaucracy that, that runs. This, that don't want him to be elected. Well, if that was true, he wouldn't have. They wouldn't have kept the fact that they were investigating him secret as you were going into the 2016 at end 2016 elections. They didn't. If they were really conspiring to get rid of him, they could have easily got rid of him. It could have been all over that. They could have announced this. Instead, they're announcing a reopened investigation in Hillary Clinton. So if there was conspiracy to prevent him from elect, being elected, they were <laughs> doing a very good job of it. So I don't buy that, but I do buy the notion of a permanent bureaucracy that is put, put into place that has self-interest. Now, during the, um, during the elections, uh, not election, during the impeachment hearings, you had a lot of civil servants coming forward and they're patriotic, they believe in what they're doing, and they're testifying, and I have no doubt that, that, that they were giving their honest assessment of what's going on, and in, in this case, I agree with them. There, there was an obvious threat to democracy by Trump's actions. I have no, no doubt about that. I, um, present, I'm not a progressive or a liberal Democrat, far from it. But in this case, the Democrats are right. Uh, the, problem, the problem is that the obvious threat, like I said, the obvious threat to our democracy is, is hiding this more long-term and more subtle threat and is skewing this argument, which we should be, discussion we should be having. And I want to go into, um, so instead of having a deep state, we do, we don't, there's no deep state conspiracy. That's ridiculous. But we do have a permanent government bureaucracy that, that, that has an interest in perpetuating itself and is probably going to resist attempts to rein it in. And so that, I believe, is real. And unfortunately, attempts to push it out, is, to, to, to point it out, or just suggest alternatives and saying that this so-called liberal democracy is not very liberal in the classical sense of the word. And it's actually quite authoritarian. But attempts to point that out and attempts to make that argument is going to be met with, you're going to brush it, oh, you're one of these deep state conspiracy theorists. So the people aren't going to take it seriously. At least serious thinkers won't take it seriously. And that's, that's the problem. <clears throat> now, I decided to continue this along this line of argument back, oh, right after I did the last show on the revolt of the public in the crisis of authority. I shared the show with a friend of mine who is the co-founder co and current chairman of this organization in, in Indonesia. They're the educational and outreach arm, a largest Muslim organization in the world, and they're called the Live for All Foundation. And my friend, he liked it, and he sent me back an email and he said, you know, because they're interested in the ideas of democracy too, they're fighting against radical Islam and they're trying to present, prevent, present their version of Islam as a, as a um, basis for freedom and justice. So he sent me back an email and he said, there's this author, I think his name is Rizard Legutko, he's Polish. And he was a Polish anti-communist resistance person during when com Poland was ruled by communists. Now, I want to apologize to our Polish members of the audience because I'm pretty sure I butchered the pronunciation of his name. So I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. But he fought back against communism. And he, when Poland was liberated, they had great hope. <clears throat> the Polish Solidarity Movement was looking towards people like Pope John Paul. And as figures of, that would lead them into, you know, this, I, for, Pope John Paul had written a lot about the crisis of the 21st, the crisis, our modern crisis is crisis of humanism, our understanding of the human person and how to, um, how to base a 
civil society or a social revolution on the dignity of the human person. And so his argument is that most of the totalitarian threats come from an underlying ideological presupposition. Premises, underlying premises. It has to do with the reality of the human being. And to um, let go of this chagrin, he found out that this problem um, with the crisis of humanism existed in the liberal democracies too. When, when he came, when Poland was free and he's looking for a relief, he said, oh my God, we're fighting some of the same problems ideologically. Yes, politically, oh, economically, we're not, being, we're not having government ownership of, of property. So therefore, it's free. Freedom. No, that's not necessarily all that communism is about, government ownership of property. That's part of it. That's a means, not an end. And as someone like this guy was aware of, Pope John Paul was aware of, he had resisted the Nazi ideology and communist ideology, and he saw them as two sides of the same coin. And he wrote about the problems that were inherent within the ideological moral suppositions that was going to make our victory over communism short-lived. Pope Benedict later on, brilliant piece called The Dictatorship of Relativism. And he predicted the um, pro problem, pro problems coming due, due to the, our philosophical idea that the basic principles upon which our political system rests were being compromised and did not match the basic principles upon which they were founded to begin with. And so Pope Benedict wrote about what he called the dictatorship of relativism. And this, this Polish gentleman, but, um, he wrote a book called uh, The Demons in Democracy. Uh, what was the subtitle? It was The Totalitarian Temptations of free, in Free Societies. And his argument was that one of the things that modern democratic systems have in common, democratic society, not systems, democratic society has in common with communist ideology, is that it is a totalitarian worldview in that politics makes up the totality of the human being is a political animal and that our nature can be shaped through political forces. And so the politics touches the totality of your life. Your, all decisions are touched by politics and your, 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 your behavior is shaped by politics. And government is the institution that the best and brightest use the levers of those institutions to shape human society to create utopia. In a sense, that's really what communism and socialism is about, the social engineering of human nature to create an ideal society. You see that in Nazism, you see that in fascism, you see that in communism, you see that in jihadism. You, the use of the state apparatus to socially engineer the conditions in the great... Now, what that utopian society looks like differs from these, among these groups. But a soft, you had the pro progressive movement in, in the late 19th century in America. You had the Fabian Socialist Movement in England. You had these various, what is, de Tocqueville would refer to as soft despotism. Although progressive, when he came here, the progressive movement wasn't very strong. So he, that was prior to de Tocqueville's coming here and he still saw hope in America then. But eventually the ideas in Europe caught up to us over here and we started to, instead of people coming over here to learn from us, it started to be the other way around. We had people, we ended up in the 19th century with people like John Dewey taking European ideas to shape American institutions, political institutions. So my argument is that the, um, what this guy is seeing is the same thing that um, Alexis de Tocqueville was seen in the European democracy that he saw a, an antidote for in American democracy. <clears throat> and I want to touch on that a little bit because in American democracy, it refer, the metaphysical principles that we have 
certain rights, inalienable rights, inalienable means non-transferable. They're, they're not get granted to us by government. Governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. They secure them. They don't, the rights are, are granted to us by our creator. And th this was not sectarian in the sense that they believed in, in these universal religious principles. And they believed that the human freedom comes from our ability to relate to a transcendent creator. So you can't have, apart from the ability to relate to the transcendent, to transcend your condition, human beings were at the mercy of forces beyond their control, whether they be political forces, and the forces of nature. And the whole notion of human free will is a religious notion that refers to our ability to transcend our temporal condition. And the founding fathers were not religious in the sense of sectarian, that they belonged to a particular different religious denomination, but they were religious in the sense that they accepted the religiosity, the religious component of human nature that we seek to transcend. And that's where freedom comes from. And we have a destiny wrapped up with our, in our relationship with our creator. So our sense of privacy, our sense of the necessity of solitude to engage in this encounter unencumbered by the crowd is something that was very important. And the whole reason, we talk about the, the threat of our Constitution, the obvious threat of when we, right now you have a president who thinks he's above the law. You know, um, and so you see there's a threat to the Constitution. That's an obvious threat. Now, a more subtle threat is the reason, what was the purpose of the Constitution to begin with? The Constitution was written to limit to the role of government to a specific set of framework to secure these rights. It wasn't to create an utopian society. It wasn't to create all these idealistic things that we're going to create. We're going to put a government bureaucracy in charge of, and then they're going to run a society for us. As a matter of fact, when Alexis de Tocqueville wrote his book, Democracy in America, he noted that in America, Americans form associations. When we create schools, we form an association. When we create hospitals, we form an association. When we create a religious organizations, there's an association. Everything is done through associations, voluntary coming together of people. Now, sometimes they'll come together for a reason, and that reason six goes away, they, 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 they might disperse. So the religion was the driving force, and the family was the permanent institution that all this stuff re re revolved around. So was the church, but more fundamental than even the church was the family. And that the key of American democracy, the rule of the people, was that the people voluntarily associated, voluntarily associated with one another in order to address issues and, and create schools and create hospitals and create all kinds of issues that we would normally. He said, in Europe, you would have a government bureaucracy, a territorial magnate or a government bureaucracy. In America, you have an association. To a large extent, that's no longer true. Both um, sides of the political spectrum are playing to their base and trying to use the government in order to create things that are going to make the, their, their, their base happy. <laughs> Republicans are supposed to be the party of limited government. Well, recent, most recently, Trump, President Trump and the Republicans are become obsessed about toilets. Oh, the water pressure is not good. We're going to do something about it. When government officials at a national level become so caught up in the minutia of human, uh, of human concerns, then you have, you're moving towards a totalitarian society because government is involving itself, its reach, and the totality of human experience. And that's where totalitarian comes from, and that's where this book is, talks about the totalitarian temptations in free societies. And uh, he should put free societies in quote because they're not really that free. And that's why you have this revolt of the public because you, you got a soft despotism. You got this control of, of ostensibly you're, you're, you're voting for the people who rule over you, but they're not ruling over you because they're setting up these government bureaucracies in order to take care of you. who are going to create the rules and, they're, and that's going to rule over you. And then you have, so there is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we a free society simply because we vote in a democratic process? Does, does the, are the institutions of a free society solely political? 
Or is the free society part of what is referred to as a plurist, pluralistic order? Now, I want to, in a future dimension, future show, I might go into this in more detail. Pluralistic order, and American society was, it was based upon this notion of a pluralistic order. Government was very limited. You had three sectors of society. It was a Trinitarian view of society, of a pluralistic society. First and most fundamental was the moral cultural sector of society. That's the dr dr driving force and reminiscent of that is um, Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Human beings have a moral sentiment towards benevolence. And we have a, a desire to reach out beyond ourselves. We, you reach out to God, and, but you, you reach your creator, you reach out to your neighbors. It's all part of an experience of transcending the self. It's part of our nature as religious beings. And like, um, no, I'd like to, Adam Smith primarily was a moral philosopher. He's known as an economist, but he's primarily a moral philosophy who took his moral philosophy and applied it to economics, and that's where he came up with his wealth of nations. But his most primary, primary work was the theory of moral sentiments. And then moral sentiment drives us. Society is either going to be held together by common moral values, moral, moral sentiments, or it's going to be held together by force because they cannot tolerate chaos. So the fundamental, most important um, sector of a, of a free society, of free people, is a moral cultural sector. And we've subsumed the moral cultural sector into the political sector. And that's why we're heading towards a society that is not a free society. And that's why we've got to revolt the public. And we've got people, oh my God, they're rejecting democratic institutions. Of course they are, because you're assume, subsuming their cultural private institutions and private privacy and private um, sector of society into a political sector of society. And then you wonder why people are... At, in, in America today, I haven't got the, the article with me, up to 70% of what the government does is dealt with is dealt with through transfer payments, transfer from one group to the other. And now, instead of being a society where we voluntarily form associations and share with one another and, and, and cooperate with one another to get things done. Now we lobby, lobby the government to take from one and give to the other. And we wonder why we're divided. You know, we're more divided today than we ever have been, a lot of people say. No, you think? <laughs> really? <laughs> Imagine that. We've got a transfer society where we're transferring wealth from one sector to another, and, and then there's corruption in politics because the stakes of winning and losing are so high because all of these sectors of society have been crammed into the political sector of society. Economic, our economics is, is another sector of society. It should be independent of the government. Pro, government should set the... The political sector society, the one that sets the rules and secures our rights, should be the minor sector of a society, if, if we have a healthy, free society. But the totalitarian temptation, as this guy wrote about, in the free society, is that we're going to turn the political sector into society to a totalitarian entity where we're going to take care of everything politics. And we think because we have democratic institutions, we have elections, free and fair elections, therefore we're a free people. That doesn't necessarily make us a free people. <laughs> and that is, I think this is why you have this revolt of the public. Again, and I can't stress this enough, I'm going to sound like a broken record. But we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we've gotten so far away from it. And I'm not saying we had it perfect. There's a lot of problems, when we, but at least in terms, you had, we had a long way to go. The, the abolitionist movement to abolish slavery was also a peace movement, was also a movement to limit government. The premises, philosophical and moral premises of one person ruling over another, that they fought against, in slavery was the same premises that, that they fought for to limit government. The rule of one person over another is something that is, was not, the Quakers didn't want to see government at all because they didn't think there was any legitimate, now I'm not saying we should go as far as the Quakers, but my argument is that the problem of slavery, which was so <clears throat> obvious an affront to our values, was 
philosophically rooted in the rule of one person over another. That one person, one set of people are d d designed to rule over another. Well, that's very similar to these 20th century totalitarian ideologies. And even the ones that, that, that are more, even the ones that are softer despotism. You've got these bureaucrats who are set to, the, the idea of self-government that is, was a very integral part of the abolitionist movement. My, my, the, the, the same ideals of our Declaration of Independence were driving the ideals of the abolitionist movement, which I considered to be the greatest moral movement in history. You took an institution that had been with us since the dawn of humankind, and you pretty much got rid of it in a large portion of the society. Well, it's coming back now, and it's never fully got rid of it, but there was a very strong resistance to the notion that some people were destined to rule over others. And I, I think that we need to get back to th this notion because which we consider to be the basis of democracy, but we're, we're not really getting, democracy is the rule of the people, but the people are not, we have a rule, we have a bureau, rule of bureaucracy. And this is, in order to have a true free society, you have to limit to the role of government and you have to have the civil sector society, moral cultural sector, civil society, has to take a more prominent role. And what, people say, well, we need to restrain runaway capitalism. Yes, restrain it with what? With shared moral values. You don't restrain it with politicians and the political sector as solely the political sector because it's gonna, they're going to be in cahoots with one another. You're going to create an, an industrial political entity that is going to... That is going to um, oh, yeah, I don't have to tell you. It's, it's, one of the reasons why you had this Occupy Wall Street, which they they were pushing for big government, but they wanted to get the the big money out of out of out of politics, and they wanted to get the control of the big money forces out of politics. Well, you're not going to do that as long as you have big government, because the big government is going to attract big money. You need to expand the role of civil society. You need the moral persuasion. You need the moral the role of shared values in order to put in check. The greed that possibly, instead of having an economic system run by greed, you have you should have an economic system run by creativity, and the desire to share the, the fruits of your creativity with others. Those are moral values that Adam Smith wrote about. It's not the check on greed and the, the desire to accumulate all these goods. It's not bureaucratic regulation. The check on that is shared moral values, and we understood that at one point, and we didn't. Fully, this experiment in my mind was never fully allowed to reach its full potential because before we got any, before we got, as we were starting to get somewhere with the abolitionist movement, all of a sudden we started having these reversal of of the flow of ideas, the flow of, uh, instead of the American Declaration of Independence going out to the world and inspiring a global abolitionist movement like it did, you had these socialist ideas, socially engineering uh, uh, utopian ideas came back and started an influence in American universities and our university system took it and through our university system and it seeped into others. So now today we have a problem with the people rejecting the institutions of democracy. And my argument is the reason why that has happened, because the institutions of democracy all by themselves do not represent the, the, a free society. It's just part of a larger picture of a pluralistic order. And we don't have that with what is called liberal democracy today because we have the moral cultural sector of society assumed into the political sector. And we, we need to reverse that and we need to get away from that. Thank you very much, and this has been Operation City on a Hill for the month of December. Next week, next month, I want to do something on the idea of poverty and enterprise, and it's called Poverty Cure for Made to Enterprise. So I will hopefully see you next month, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, and have a nice night.